welcome back to the UK Thrashers radio show. Thank you for coming back to us. We know we've had a few weeks off, but we hope you're going to enjoy the next run of interviews we've got for you. Starting tonight as John talks to John MacGyver of authoring fame, as well as lots of other things. Before that, though, let's kick off with some music. This is our pals Novichok, taken from their brand new EP, Emperor of Lies. This is On This Side. on this side from our mates in Novichok. From the northeast, let's get down to London. This is a new track by Temper Shot. This is Afterburner. Thank you. 
fucking fool. Okay, next up, John chats to his old mate, Joel MacGyver. Check it out. This week I catch up with Joel McIver, author, journalist, magazine editor and bass player, in that order. He's written books on and interviewed most of the big names in metal and thrash, along with a fair few others. Cards on the table, I've been friends with Joel since we were at junior school together and lived in the same village. We learned bass together at school and I used to borrow his amp when I had gigs. We reminisce about the old days and find out how you get to write books on your childhood heroes. Fucking hell. Right, so this is your podcast, is it? Uh, no, it's not mine. It's, um, it's a guy called Neil who... Um... Everyone knows a bloke called Neil with the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he, runs, <laughs> he runs UK Thrashers. So, oh, yeah, um, yeah, right. You told me about it. All right, good. Yeah, so no, he's a good guy and he's, he's set it all up and everything. And uh, yeah, he, he, I interviewed um, Aaron from Paradise Lost the other week. No. Is he a good big... bloke? I haven't met him. Is he a good guy? Yeah, a really nice guy, actually, yeah. He's not, mm. not at all gloomy or miserable, as you might expect. And, no, <laughs> yeah. All that sort of doom stuff I got into work much later on. Um, but I still don't know about it as well as I should. I, I really haven't really progressed that much from when we were in the sixth. I don't think you do, do you? Get new music in your sort of <laughs> late teens, early twenties, and it never really changes that much, does it? The core of it stays the same. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it's your fault. You got me into it. You take responsibility. <laughs> as you, as you keep saying, your parents were very pleased. <laughs> <laughs> I remember lending Robin uh, a copy of Chrome Molly. Thanks for the angst. <laughs> Chrome Molly. <laughs> And we used to read the Making Music, do you remember that free paper thing? Mate, I wish it still existed. And actually, we can talk about this because, um, so the first proper magazine job I got was on Record Collector, right? Yeah. And um, we were working for this. In fact, it's a good time to mention this because the guy I worked for was this legendary journalist called Alan Lewis, right? He was the editor of the mag. And he's the guy who, who started Kerrang! And employed Jeff Barton, who then came up with the term new wave of British heavy metal, right? Because, oh, okay. because he was championing Iron Maiden in 1979. So that was all the stuff you listened to. I think you were way more into that than I was, particularly. Yeah, all the real nerd you, you, stuff. You, you, well, you knew way more about it, and uh, I didn't really have a clue. But um, So when I went to Record Collector, I was working with this guy, Alan Lewis, and um, he had these stories like you would not believe, right? Like Iron Maiden were nothing, you know, and they came to him and said, can we please have some exposure, you know, stuff like that. And he went, oh, go on, all right, you know, just wanting to cover some local bands. Um, and then there was this need for a heavy metal magazine. Um, so he launched Kerrang! And that went, like, massively stratospheric. Yeah. Um, and then we talked about making music, right? That was why I brought this up, because um, it, he said, oh, you're a bass player. Do you remember making music? I said, what do I remember it? I lived for that magazine, like, every mm. week. There was nothing yeah. else. Yeah. Uh, when probably when I thought so what I was in the sixth form and then probably the year or two after was when I could get it and I said how and he said he either worked on it he knew people who worked on it and I said how did it work because it was free and I didn't understand that it could be purely advertising driven but but that would work back then mm. um, but it did because ev- ev- because the British um, MI industry music instrument industry was just so full of money mm. because at that point in the 80s everyone was spending like 3,000 quid on a status um, yeah. 4,000 quid on a Trace Elliott stack. Mm. Um, they probably did buy Warwick's and all that stuff as well, but there was this real thing. Steinberg as well. I mean, like, just the British industry was just, not that Steinberg was British, but the, the industry was just flooded with money. Mm. So you could have a magazine that would print 100,000 copies a week um, and it would make its money for advertising, not newsstand sales. So that was a kind of a little publishing quirk um but i loved that mag i still remember some quotes <laughs> from articles in it because yeah, uh, it wasn't so straight faced was it straight laced it used to have there's some really funny stuff in it as well wasn't there? Like, right, it took the piss stuff. relentlessly yeah 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 but i mean fairness a lot of the mags do still mm. um there's uh, basically everybody read that as a teenager is now editing or publishing all the mags <laughs> that we now know <laughs> so, that, that, that remain you know yeah. so many have gone down um so that yeah no i loved the the uh, irreverent sense of humor that it had yeah yeah okay all right, mate, cool. All right, well, um, so I'll, I'll do an intro and stuff and, and top it and tail it and all that shit later. Good stuff, um, mate, yeah, go ahead. So I'll introduce you. So, yeah, I mean, just obviously I know you quite well. So just give us a brief synopsis of your career today, not in too much detail, just, you know, from sort of school and university and how you got where you are, really, and what you've been up to. Uh, uh, well, I knew you at school. We were friends. And um, thanks to you, I was introduced to studying bass and perhaps more, for, more profoundly 
listening to heavy metal. I had no idea about that stuff before that, really. Um, so thanks to you and a couple of other people that we knew in common, I started to really like that stuff. Went off to university, did a degree in German, and didn't really do anything of note for the rest of my 20s until I became a journalist on a magazine called Record Collector, um, where I was fairly quickly um, the guy who wrote about um, metal and dance music. <laughs> I, I don't really know why. Those are the things I'd spent the 90s listening to. And then... Um, very quickly, uh, I got a book deal, my first book, which was called Extreme Metal, which is this pretty cheesy uh, encyclopedia of, of thrash death metal and, and, and stuff. And um, a, a lot of authors look back on their first book with total embarrassment and they cringe. And I understand that because when I read that first one, not that I ever do, but when I look at it, uh, it does seem it amateurish. You know, it's, it's a bit um, naive. And I'm trying very hard to make some jokes in it that just are not remotely funny. <laughs> And um, but it, it wasn't terrible, but it's not great. And and then, but it did well actually. So second book along, we did a book called Slipknot, who were just coming up at the time. This is twenty years ago. Um, and then after that, I just kept going. Book deals just kept coming in because I worked on Record Collector, which was taken seriously by book publishers. Um, and uh, then I wrote a book about Metallica, and that was a bestseller. Um, and that was a real hit for me because it enabled me to jack in my job at Record Collector and become a full time author and journalist just working from home, which was good for me because that was, that was when my kids were coming along and I wanted to be a, 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 at home to see them grow up. And that's it really. And since then, uh, I think I'm on book 34 in 22 years. Um, there's a few more coming up, a few more lined up for the next couple of years. Um, I'm the editor of Bass Player Magazine uh, and have been for three years. And before that, I was the editor of Bass Guitar Magazine. Um, and I do a bit of teaching. I do a bit of freelance writing. I gig out every now and then with friends just for a bit of a laugh. And that's really what I do, John. So here we are. I'm 50 years old. <laughs> are you still Coming looking for a career? career. <laughs> isn't that hey? good? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, they say a career, a career is what you had when you look back. Yeah. That's what they say, isn't it? So there yeah, you go. So, that's me. Yeah. It's when you realise you actually there's nothing else is going to happen. and You've had your career and that was it. Yeah. It was when you were <laughs> looking around for something else to do. You had one. So, so, so yeah. So, I mean, obviously, I, did, I never knew you did a degree in German. Well, I didn't really do it for any particular reason. I just happened to be quite good <laughs> just, at it at school. Just putting off getting a job. <laughs> no, I, yeah, it was weird, really. I, I guess I was always going to do a degree. Um, my brother Robin had much clearer ideas about what he wanted to do with his life, so he did something a bit more useful. But I was just good at languages at school, so I did German. And I've never really used it, although it did get me the job at Record Collector, actually, because they were looking for a journalist who could speak German in order to launch a German language version of Record Collector. And that never happened, so I just moved on to the main magazine as, a, as, as a, one of the editors. Um, so I, I guess the degree was partly responsible for getting I mean, me going. Yeah, I mean, to get the job at Record Collector, I mean, was that, I mean, usually, I mean, these days, especially with jobs and stuff, you have to demonstrate you've done the job for like, you've got so yeah. much experience, you know, I guess. So how did you get the job back in the day? I did, I did have some freelance experience. I, uh, I'd okay. written a couple of things uh, for the most unlikely publications. I'd written something for Cosmopolitan, um, <laughs> okay. right? Because I had a, a friend who was an editor there who helped me out. And I'd written some educational stuff as well. Having been mm. a teacher, I'd done a little bit of, a few little things here and there for educational um, publication um, so yeah I sort of just wangled my way in really with a bit of experience in the German degree and um, yeah it's fluky really that was in 99 yeah, okay. so I really spent the night doing very little of note um, <laughs> which is partly <laughs> so, why I started playing bass. so yeah yeah well I've always played a bit of bass I never really kept it up professionally like you did um, I swear to you uh, the first that first summer when we started learning bass at school by the end of that summer, I was probably about half half as good as I am now. You know what I mean? In, that, in the thirty years, I've probably only I haven't gained any profoundly different skills since that one summer. Where I just sat at home, just playing those stupid riffs. Yeah, because you've got like responsibilities now, and you've got to earn a, earn a living and all that kind of stuff. You, you, yeah, but in my you, yeah, but even so, in my job, I, I play these amazing bases all day, every day, as part of my yeah. gig. Uh, yeah. I have to review stuff and I have to allocate reviews and all that, and write about it constantly and interview bass players. Um, so bass is a big part of my life. But uh, I don't, I've never gone out and done the sort of eight months on the road thing that really oh. turns you into a master musician. I never did that. Um, mm. But it's funny, you know, my kids are both musicians. My son's an amazing drummer. My daughter plays the piano. And um, the, the, you can acquire amazing skills really fast, can't you, when you're a teenager? Yeah. Um, which you can't uh, in later life. So, yeah, I'll, I'll never... Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll never be a Victor Wooten, you know what I mean, ever. If you, I mean, if you were to be in a band, what, would it be a metal band or would it be something else? Probably not. I don't, I, I've don't. i done a few metal gigs. I don't really have the pick in hand, actually. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to play a little bit of funk. 
Um, I, even though I'm not really a slapper, I can kind of half-ass it. But um, no, I like to do a little a funky line that plays around with the with the with the beat a little bit. Um, probably something like that, something mm. something finger styled. I think I used to be all about the pick and the downstrokes, and mm. then as the as the years passed, you realise if you sort of lift it up a bit, <laughs> it's not as rock. But you know, you you can play a bit more easily. It doesn't knack your wrist as much. Um, <laughs> and since I discovered mids on an amp, um, <laughs> then you, you realise you don't need a pick to cut through, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah. I've, I've just always preferred finger style. It's much nicer, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, so, 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 you're a record collector. I mean, how? I mean, what, I, I, I never understood this. So, how does the writing books about bands and artists happen? Do publishers come to you, or do you pitch ideas? No, you have to them? pitch. Right. It, it okay. works. So, so now I'm a bit of a name. Uh, both publishers will come to me, and artists will come to me asking me to write their autobiography with them. Cool. Uh, right. So I don't have to fight too hard to get work. In fact, I turned down a lot of gigs, but um, a lot of books that just aren't. The deal isn't right, although I'm not interested, or I haven't got time. Uh, but no, the first couple of years, I definitely had to pitch quite hard. But I, I had an advantage because my day job was on a magazine that was taken seriously by those publishers. Yeah, so yeah. The, the pitch wasn't thrown into the bin as, it, as so often happens. So it's a bit like you know try, trying to get a, a record deal or something, or, lay, or deal with a label or something similar kind of thing, is yeah. it? You say, you know, I think so. In the, it, it is very similar in that, yeah, you have to get some sort of company to trust you enough to take a risk on you. Yeah. Um, and as a record company is essentially a bank that lends a loan to a musician, um, I suppose it's the same in that a publisher will publish your book at their own risk. They'll give mm. you they'll give you an advance, but that's not recoupable. Uh, sorry, it's recoupable, but it's not refundable. So if your, if your book doesn't sell any copies, you yeah. still get to keep the advance. Um, so it's all their risk, essentially. Um, or mm. The financial risk is theirs. You have to write the book and spend all that time putting that together. So, you, you know, you that that could that could be wasted if the book didn't get published but that never happens um so yeah so so i mean is it so is it the case it's that, like that it's all right it's it, easier once you've done it for years and years or something yeah so i mean so is it i mean they look at things like how big artists are and their album sales and all that kind of stuff yeah, all that and then nowadays it's what, that. what's their sales platform nowadays it's are they mm. are they have they got six million followers on youtube yeah. um yeah so i did a book with um well, the latest book is uh, Frank Bellow's autobiography, mm, I saw that. Yeah. Anthrax, as you know. And um, he and I have known each other for a few years, and we always had this idea of doing this book. And I knew it'd be a crazy story because he's had a mad life. Mm. Um, so, it, so when he and I approached this particular publisher in LA that we've partnered with, they knew who we both were, um, so they were willing to enter a dialogue. Um, and off we went. It was quite smooth. But whereas it wouldn't have been 20 years ago if it had been my first book, I think. So. No, no, okay, it's a lot easier, I guess. I noticed that you've got, let's look through your Wikipedia page, which I trust is 100% correct. Yeah, mate. Yeah. I, well, funny thing, someone created that Wikipedia page, and it becomes a burden because um, <laughs> you have to check that it's right, and yeah. you have to update it, and so on and so on, and undo the odd bit of funny vandalism by your friends, which happens from time to time. <laughs> Well, I noticed that, that Frank Frank Bello did um, did a did a forward on something a while back, didn't it? A few years ago, he did so the afterword. You... Yeah, I did a book about Cliff Burton, mm. and the original edition had a forward by um, Kirk Hammett. Mm. And then when the uh, the book came out five years later, when an anniversary came along with Cliff's death, um, Frank did an afterword to add to it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So do you find you you get to meet people that way, and then you, you sort of develop a relationship then, and then later on you end up doing something more than a few few years down the road. It kind of is like that, yeah. As it would be in any line of work, really. Uh, I think I'd interviewed Frank a couple of times for the for various magazines. We stayed in touch, and um, uh, I think I went through Anthrax's management to get him to do that. And then, as I knew him personally, I can reach out to him as a friend. Uh, and then the book came along, and it's just I mean I've been doing this for quite a while a sort of 24 years now i guess as a writer about music so as a result i know a lot of people yeah. not in a not in a oh look at my famous friends kind of thing a lot of journalists <laughs> do do that yeah yeah and uh i'll be the first to say that no there are a lot of people that i know um like i, I have a famous person's number but i wouldn't call it you know what i mean it yeah. would be inappropriate to do so even yeah. where some people will flash their phone books around and say, hey look who i've got you know um which i don't tend to do it's a bit crass and it? it's not it's not it's not the dumb thing cheesy, it? it's cheesy it's funny yeah. it, it can be funny you know i remember um a mate of mine i was like i think oh, we were pissed that was it and i was in the pub and this friend of mine was going on about how much he loves level 42 mm. and i know more i know mark king quite well <laughs> and uh so i phoned him up <laughs> hey my mate wants to talk to you which you should never do because it's so no. professional mm. and um 
he was in the middle of a gig or something and he wasn't best pleased to be disturbed. You know, he's like, fucking hell, John, I'm soundtracking. Oh, sound checking. <laughs> and I go, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but uh, he's a good guy and he forgave me that, I think. Yeah, yeah I just noticed that there's no level 42 book on your list. I guess that never happened then. <laughs> no, I've talked to Mark about it. In all seriousness, I, uh, yeah. I've had a word with Mark and I think he'll do one someday. Yeah. But uh, you have to be, if you're going to do your autobiography, you have to feel that you, what do you have to feel? you have to feel that most of your life is past, I think. Um, yeah. And I think yeah. a lot of these guys who are in their 50s and 60s still probably have 10, 15, 20 years of playing to go. Mm. Um, so I'm not referring to Mark King in particular, but a lot of people have stuff um, that they're just not ready to disclose <laughs> just yet, <laughs> you know, um, because there's too many rock and roll stories. Lars Ulrich always, um, is always asked uh, by people, uh, including me, if, if he wants to do an autobiography. And he says, the problem is I know where too many bodies are buried. <laughs> which is um which is a good way of putting it um and in fact you always have to be very sensitive about the stuff you put in these books because everyone has stuff that doesn't really need to be put in black and white um, i can imagine you have to self-center a lot i guess don't you and sort of you just do. Know where the lines are, and yeah. like so i'll be sitting with someone of some musician and we'll be talking and having a laugh and the stories that you tell in that situation over a beer um are, are really funny and fine but then when you see them written in black and white the kind of the humor goes out of them. So you, you, quite often they get pulled out of the text at the last minute. These are not mm-hmm. terrible things. These are just things that are perhaps just a little bit. <laughs> you really want the world <laughs> knowing that, I don't know, you, you had bit. a terrible, you had a terrible gastric complaint right before you went on stage, you know, that kind of stuff. You know. So, um, so yeah, I mean, talk about the sort of Metallica book. I mean, has that been your biggest seller to date, do you think, in terms of... Well, I did one about Metallica and one about Cliff Burton. Do you, do you yeah. mean the uh, Metallica book? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the Metallica one. The first one yeah, the first I, guess it, right. I guess it has, partly because it's been in print longer. I wrote that in 2004, or it, it was published in 2004. Because um, that's, that's like un- unauthorised, isn't it? The band... It is, yeah. Involved. Yeah, so yeah, yeah like, although I got a nice compliment. I got a very nice compliment from Lars about it, actually, uh, in, uh, a couple of years later when I was interviewing him. But um, yeah, all you, basically, you can um, uh, you can write a book about anybody okay. you want, uh, as long as what you say is not libelous. Yeah, um, I've done both things. So I've written people's authorized books uh, and I've written unauthorized books, and they both have their advantages. And it's important to remember that an authorized book is not always good just because it's authorized. Um, just just as an unauthorized book is not bad because it's unauthorized. If you're a professional journalist and you've got some experience, then you will be able to draw to paint a picture of someone in an unauthorized way that is fair and professional and good. Mm. Um, but it doesn't have the sort of the, um, and the, and the great thing is you don't have to go through management and get them to approve it and get them to sign off every single word. And you're like, you know, <laughs> punching yourself in the face and God, why don't I do this? So, um, uh, and just to finish. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, whereas an, uh, an authorized book is obviously you make more money. Um, it's sort of more satisfying in a way, I think. Um, so I did, I think I did about, I think I've done about 20, 22 or something, just me writing books about bands. Yeah. Um, and then the last um, sort of eight to 10 years has really been bands inviting me to work with them. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much a transition that happened, you know, like I say. That must years. be a nice sort of subtle transition, I guess, a different sort of It is nice. Of, it's vindication know, as well, you know. Yeah. yeah, because you, you, you write that much stuff. And if it's well-received and well-reviewed, and most of my stuff has been, fortunately, um, then they take notice of you and mm. ask you to come and work with them. So, so, so did you know the, the guys from Metallica before you wrote The Unauthorised? No, I had interviewed a couple of them for magazines when I wrote that book. So I, I, I had met them. I wouldn't say I knew them personally. Um, no, subsequently, funny enough, I went on to interview them all loads of times. Yeah. Um, so it's you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, to the point where they knew my name. But, right, uh, okay. So, the, but, 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 I mean, how did they, you say that Lars wrote something nice or said something nice about it later, but it must have been a bit weird, you know, Oh, after you've done an unauthorized thing, was it? Is it like that at depends all? Depends what you've said. No, it hasn't been weird. It depends what you've said. Um, if you know, I've never really slagged off these bands massively. No. Um, I've made a point that some of the music wasn't to my taste, where it wasn't to my taste, but not in a not in a. You know, you can be you can be. What, what am I trying to say? You can be negative about someone, and it can still be constructive. You know. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be destructive criticism. Uh, so no, that's never really been a problem. Um, in fact, people are generally complimented that you took the time to write about them. Mm. Um, uh, with a, you know, I think have we ever pissed anybody off? Maybe once or twice. Yeah, no, there are, there are horror stories that you hear, which I've mm. never had ever. You know, like people writing a book and suddenly a phone call comes in. You know what I mean? From some shark-like manager in a Hollywood office saying, you know, I'll see you in court. You know, 
yeah. uh, and that does happen. So you, you've got to watch out. But I think in the case of the Metallica book, they would probably have had their legal team check it over for anything libelous. Um, okay. But beyond that, beyond that, they wouldn't comment on it. So you'd, assume was, known, you'd assume known about it. You don't, you don't give them a text beforehand. So we said we'd put this out as a courtesy. We'll let you see it. I've done that once or twice. I didn't okay. do it in that case. I've done it once or twice with, with a couple of bands on that list. I've said, um, would you like to just check it over? Uh, not not because we're going to make it public public knowledge that you've done so, but just mm. for my own relationship with you. And yeah. that's always appre- always appreciated. But yeah. not always. It's, it's no. never really weird, John. It's not, it's not as weird as you might think. No. Um, what's, it's, it's, what's complex is when you do someone's autobiography, you have to get them to get everyone in it to sign off what was said about them. Oh, really? So, I mean, uh, in the case of Frank's book, I happen to know Charlie Benanti and Scott Ian, so I could just email them and say, is this all right? And they said, yeah. Um, but um, there are people that you don't know that, that the subject has talked about, and they have to really chase down approval in writing otherwise, just for, just for uh, legal security. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that, that's just a bit of a box picking exercise that needs to happen. Um, so it's just about due diligence, you know, getting it all done. Yeah. It's just being professional. And like you say, once you've got a reputation yeah. like you have and you've done a good job and then people are yeah. a lot more accepting of it, you know. They are, but you, but this industry is populated by nutters. So <laughs> even even though you may do your due diligence, you know, people people may still get irked with you for something that didn't happen, you know. And, and that's sometimes, it hasn't really happened, actually. It's happened to friends of mine. A yeah. um, mate of mine did, uh, did, the, did the book of a well-known metal musician. I'll, I'll tell you who it is offline. And um, that that yeah, metal musician subsequently denied having seen the text. No, right. Said, oh no, my co-writer, I, I, I didn't write that. I didn't want to write that, <laughs> even though the fucker had signed it off literally in writing, which is hilarious. But that happens yeah. too. But I mean, I mean, in terms of you know, book sales for bands and stuff, is it financially? Um, is, is it worth sort of bands doing it and stuff? Is it? I mean, because be. yeah, not every band, yeah, not yeah, every band. I've had, no. I've had a. Sorry, mate, I'm interrupting you, but no. I had, a, I've, I've had a couple of you know, no names, but not huge bands contact me and say, would I like to work with them? And while I would like to, for my own interest, the, the deal isn't really there because we're not a particularly big band. So mm. um, I've had to pass. So uh, in that situation, what a lot of bands do is we'll self-publish. Yeah. They'll, they'll print off a couple of hundred books and sell it on their merch stand, which is perfectly good. You know, they don't, they don't need someone like me and they don't need a publisher. Mm. Um, and that works, you know. Well, that seems to, again, that's, you know, again, the whole, the whole technology and everything else, that seems to be, something people are doing more and more of, you know, literally printing yeah. their own books, yeah? It is, and as a result, um, so the, the, the upside is that everybody has that ability, but the downside is that there's a lot of really awful books out there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, the upside um, is everyone can do it, and the downside is everyone can do it. <laughs> precisely, like the internet in general, right? Yeah, yeah there is that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I think, well, I'll, I'll just write a book, I'll start tomorrow, and I'll publish it next week myself. Mm. And that's when I get a phone call from someone who said, you know, I thought I'd write this in a week, and I haven't done it, I can't believe it, it's really hard. <laughs> yeah. I see. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, no. What's happened a few times is someone's got in touch with me. Oh, I really want to tell you who it is, but I can't. Okay. Someone you totally know, mm. a, a singer involved in a big band, emailed me and said, "Oh, uh, would you do my book? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, oh, yeah. I'm interested. Yeah, you're a big name. Yeah. Um, this is typically what I charge." <laughs> and this guy crapped himself. Went, what? No, I'm not paying that. And that was the end of that. And then about two weeks later, I got this message saying, "Yeah, actually, it's really hard, this, isn't it?" Maybe could could be. I think I might take you up on that. Well, there you go. Yeah, you do it yourself if you want. Not everybody can spend six months writing a book. You know, a hundred thousand words, difficult. Yeah. And even if you do manage to get it done on time, and you know, all those words, it might be crap. Yeah. So it helps to get a professional involved. You know. So I mean, do you have depending on which which book you're doing? I mean, else you have editors and stuff and things like that. Is that normally the publisher will will edit the text when you submit it right. but i am but i am already a magazine editor and a book editor so i know pretty much what what to submit yeah. so it's it's always been a pretty quick process at their end which i think is probably why i keep getting asked to do them mm. um it's not really about um having massive talent as a writer or indeed anything i think it's about keeping communications really prompt hitting your deadline um responding quickly and positively to what what needs doing and i do all that stuff um, and as a result, people, I think, tend to think, well, he's quite easy to work with. We'll work with him again. Yeah. Um, it's not that I'm Ernest Hemingway or Oscar Wilde <laughs> in my text. <laughs> no, no. I, I guess that's, that's like anything in life. It's just being professional, isn't it? And being you know, sort of responsive and not, not, not ignoring the little people when you moved up a state, you know, all that kind of stuff. No, that's you right. are and always will be one of the little people. That's my attitude, you know, unless <laughs> yeah. you own Microsoft or Facebook. Then, yeah. <laughs> And that's yeah. the healthy attitude, you know, you, you should be like that. 
No, no, it's cool. So, I mean, obviously, you've, you've, I mean, obviously, starting this towards, I know you've done loads of stuff, but starting this towards the uh, the UK thrashers side of it, I mean, you've right. covered the sort of Slayer, you've done the Slayer book and everything back in 2008, was that? The yeah, Rose and I did, a, I did a, let me see what else we've done. This is the, the Frank's, Frank's book is the first book I've done on Anthrax, so there were two on Metallica. I did David Ellison's book of Megadeth. So yeah. I've, I've done a lot of that Big Four stuff yeah. and endlessly, endlessly written about it as a journalist for uh, Metal Hammer. Yeah, and for all the guitar, bass, and drums magazines you can think of, um, mostly in the uh, 2000s, in that decade, that's that was when I was more of a freelancer. I wasn't editing bass player at the time, so I was zipping around Europe, really, you know, uh, interviewing these people. I think I interviewed Kerry King 13 times or something <laughs> mental like that over a period of about. He must about have known your name years. by the end of that. Yeah, he did. Yeah, over a period of about 13 years. Tom Araya, I remember the first time I interviewed him, I was completely, completely starstruck. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, he turned out to be a really nice guy, so that was good. Mm. Um, so Slayer was my big thing, really. Um, that was my band that I, I still listen to. Oh, of all metal bands, that's probably the band I listen to most now. Yeah. And my son's really into it as well, so he listens to it on the school run, you know, all that good stuff. Um, and then of the UK, if you want to get into the UK for our stuff, um, I did talk a lot about um, Evile, those first couple of records. I met those guys a lot. I thought they were amazing, and I still mm. do. Yeah, good. Um, I know, what's his name? Your boy... Out of, um, Howard Smith, what's he in? Acid Rain. You must know him. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. H Acid Rain. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, he's a really good lad. I've been on his podcast a couple of times and met him once or twice. Um, and I, I guess I never really got too deeply into the the old school British thrashers that we were listening to when we were at school. So mm. you, mem- you remember Slammer and Reanimator and all that stuff. Yeah, and Zentrix and stuff. Yeah. And I think you knew Onslaught pretty well, didn't you? You got to know yeah, them. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I was, oh. Again, I, I kind of got into them a little, a little bit after the sort of second album and in search of sanity and stuff, and then they kind of exploded after that. But again, they've been back for what 10, 15 years now, haven't they? I think you and I went to see them, didn't we? Like 10 years ago or something at the comeback show in Bristol at the Fleece and Firkin. I think you were there. Yes, and I was yes, there. yes, oh, yes you did. Too. Yes, I remember ages like, ago. I was with a mate of mine called Ian Glasper. Do you know Ian? Uh, I know, uh, yeah, I've not met him, but I know, I know the name, and we've, we've, yeah, because he's done. Because he knows the guys from from Purgatory. He knows everybody. Yeah, you should get you should get him on this. I'll connect you with him if you want. Mm. Um, and he's also an author. Does tons and tons of really good books. Yeah. Um, and everyone knows Ian, and uh, he's amazing. Do you work for that well. new magazine? For, is it Fistful of Metal or whatever it's called? He probably does. I don't know. He was on Terrorizer <laughs> for years and years and years. Uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, oh, I can't. Yeah, Fistful of Metal is that that's the new one, isn't it? Iron Fist was one for ages, wasn't it? That was that was. Yeah, I think edited, about... edited by Louise, who used to edit Terrorizer. Yeah, um, yeah, they were good those mags, but they were never very big. Metal Hammer has always been the British mag, and Kerrang until Kerrang went down. Yeah, I, I mean, often. generally, I mean, I mean, the, the, the sort of decline of print media and stuff has just been mm. incredible. The last, yeah, it's few, really few sad. A lot of good friends of mine have lost their jobs. Yeah, uh, through no fault of their own. It's it's a combination of, well, obviously in the last year it's been a combination of a people not being able to get to newsstands, yeah, to buy the magazines, but even before that, advertising was heading more towards Facebook and Google. Yeah, and paper stocks were getting more expensive so you add all that up and mm. then I think people probably people had a certain sort of eco idea as well about consuming print media which I totally get you know I don't know people I don't know anybody anybody under about 40 who buys print magazines no. um, maybe 35 maybe 40 is a bit ungenerous but uh, in the case of bass player mag the one that I edit fortunately I have a, a ton of um, uh, of readers uh, of a certain age who love the physical artifacts so yeah. as well. although there's a digital edi- edition as well but mm. um, no, so that mag's got like touch wood, it's got some legs in it for a while. Yeah, I guess it'll reach the, the kind of like a, there's a point, it'll reach a level, and then that hopefully it won't dip below that. And if you make it, it work, do. Like, I mean, it's been going for 30 years, it's a heritage magazine. So when mm. magazines have heritage on their side, it helps. Um, and also, it's not the, the, the biggest mags are the ones at most risk because mm. if they sell hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, thousands of copies a week, um, they can't really sink to be a pit and met. A mere shadow of themselves and survive weirdly it's mm. more i mean base bay is, re- is a relatively niche magazine um and yeah. it occupies as such it occupies a fairly un- unthreatened slot if you see what i mean mm. um so yeah anyway what were we talking about um <laughs> Zentric, remember thrash? Was it thrash? <laughs> there we were. yeah slayer i think it was so how did you slayer, right obviously you've been interviewing over the years and stuff and then how did yeah. the book come about then uh, i just suggested it to the publisher there isn't a book about slayer why don't we do one and, um, I find it amazing took, there wasn't a book about Slayer. You know? Well, they took a bit persuading. Um, 
I probably could have persuaded a smaller publisher who would have paid a smaller amount of money to do one more easily. You know what I mean? Mm, this yeah. is a good sized publisher who paid a nice big chunk. And so as a result, I had to really work on uh, pitching it to them. Um, and I think finally I got them to sit down and look at um, uh, sales figures and, and heritage and stuff like that. And, it, and so it came off. But um, you've, got to, you've got to believe me when I tell you that most publishers in this country, even even sort of switched on ones. I haven't even heard of Led Zeppelin, you know. So <laughs> if you say, um, yeah, I'm doing this, this book by Slayer, it's, they're kind of a bit like Metallica, you know. You, they're not <laughs> really, you say that. But you, yeah, right, they have these things called guitars. And um, they go, what, what, what are you talking about? And you're like, oh, God. <laughs> um, fortunately, Omnibus Press, who did this one, are far more clued in than that. And it got done, and it was really nice. Do you have a copy? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, do, I do have a copy of the Slayer one, yeah. All yeah. right, cool. So the hardback was a nice big doorstop, you know, not... Mm. Coffee, like a mouse coffee, coffee it, table you know. special, yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have it lying around. The, the rainforest is sorely depleted, thanks to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, that one turned out well. I was pleased with that. The mm. municipal waste guys did the foreword for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking through your. Uh, I've printed out your Wikipedia page and it's got it all in there. Excellent. So the only place to I've done extensive research. This is the kind of research you do, yeah. Just look on Wikipedia. Well, Wikipedia, I, you know how you can donate to Wikipedia if you want. Yes. As, as, yeah. Well, I do that because it, it saves me having to have a website. I had a website for years. You, years. you did have one. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, uh, my first one, the first incarnation of it was very metal. It had all this blood and um, it was all black and red and skulls. Skulls. Yeah. Well, that was the, the. There was a reason for that. It was because. The first book, Extreme Metal, was all black and red with, you know, dripping blood everywhere and all that stuff. So it, it mirrored the design of the book. But as time passed and I started writing about other things, it started to look a bit stupid. So um, uh, I got it rebuilt. And then I just got rid of it. And, uh, just well, yeah. I mean, what, what, yeah, you don't, you don't need. I mean, so, I mean, obviously, you, know, you started off doing the metal stuff, you know, the sort of the extreme metal, the Slipknot, new metal and all that kind of stuff. And then there's a bit of an, an abrupt, abrupt turn into... Ice Cube. Erica, Erica, no, well, Ice Cube. Then Erica, Erica Badu, Badu, Badu. I don't Badu, know. Erica Badu, yeah, it's a bit of a left, I mean, left turn. I mean, how did you? I mean, not going into that too much, but how did you sort of approach that? How did that come about? Well, I mean, I like the music anyway, right? So the, yeah. uh, that that publisher asked me to do it, um, oh, and they said, well, we just grabbed the guys and did the Well, no, they they just said, look, we need this book doing. Do you want to do it? And mm-hmm. I went, yeah. And actually, uh, uh, it, I wanted to not just write books about metal. Yeah, you want well. to be you want to be pigeonholed, do you, too much? Even though you are. Now. No, not really. Although I have really been subsequently, and it's only really been the last five years that I've done different stuff. So I did a book with Woody Woodmansey, who was the drummer in David, David Bowie's band. Yeah. I did John Mayall's autobiography. Yeah. The old yeah. blues guy, the blues breakers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm just doing a book with uh, a pop band of note from the nineties. <laughs> uh, which I will review in due course. So the idea is to move on a bit away from um, constant metal. Although I, I love that stuff, and I'll keep going. Yeah. Do, do any of the bands you sort of like? You say you know, so pop bands and stuff. Do you ever look back at your sort of career history and say, "All oh, right, I don't know any of this stuff." Yeah, they do. Yeah. They go, "What <laughs> shit you listen <laughs> to?" Them, shit you listen to. <laughs> but I mean, generally, I've had that all my life, John. I'm sure you have too. Like yeah. people saying, "Why are you listening to this terrible music?" And yeah. over the years, I've learned just not to bother trying to sell it to people. They either get it. Or they, or they think it's crap, and I totally get that. Yeah, fine. I guess, so I'm sure my parents said something about you, you sat your dad down once, um, and and um, and 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 tried to go through all the different genres of metal with him, and by like the third, the third snippet, he was like his eyes had glazed over. I don't remember that, but it's highly probable. <laughs> it my mum, like my mum and dad never got it. No. I remember, I remember very clearly. It must have been about '89. Maybe I was just about off to university. Uh, we had in our house a kind of cool hi-fi system, right? Mm. And you plug the when you plug the um, headphones in, you had to turn the speakers off, right? Yeah. Uh, otherwise, the speakers and the headphones would work. Oh, it was time. a separate switch for those headphones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I put um, um, "No Remorse" by Metallica, <laughs> which is on Kill 'Em All. Yeah. On that, right? And maxed it up for the fast bit at the end, which I really love. Like really, really loud through headphones, but I forgot to switch off the speakers, right? <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, like, oh, I'm really into it. And my mum comes running in, ah! <laughs> what are you doing? Because this was a really loud hi-fi. My yeah. dad took great pride in this thing. And I was going, what's the matter with you? And I realised I hadn't turned off the speakers and it was blasting this stuff out. So you take the headphones uh, off and it's the music's still there. Uh, <laughs> oh, whoops. <laughs> Sorry, mum. <laughs> Sorry. 
Sorry, but about, she yeah. totally did not get it, and and I and I, I understand that, you know, and and Dad understood it a little bit more because he'd been to Woodstock, you know, and he he had he had a cool um, record collection, but he even he didn't understand the screaming and the shouting and, and the bellowing and the atonal solos, and you know, why why would they? You know, I'm, I'm not, I don't blame them for that. It's, a, it's probably a generational thing. Yeah, um, definitely, yeah, you know. definitely, yeah. I mean, I saw Cradle of Filth the first time about five years ago, and actually, when actually sort of <laughs> sit back and think. Listen to what Danny Phil's doing. He's like, yeah, I almost don't get it myself, but I love it. But you know, <laughs> it's hard to defend, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, but at the same time, I love really mellow music and always have done, and, yeah. and all kinds of music. So I totally, totally get it. And sometimes I'm not in the mood either. I don't want to hear Morbid Angel, you know, when I'm <laughs> eating a boiled egg. <laughs> and sometimes I do, you know. Um, but you know, what what we do when our kids were young was play them that music quietly mm. and with all the treble taken off. So that the symbols and a the bit like your bass amp. <laughs> right, right. Good point. There's a pattern emerging. <laughs> but the point was, and then we used to call it. I, it was specifically Cradle of Filth. Actually, I remember playing Cradle of Filth and saying to them when they were tiny, "Okay, this is called the running around in circles music, right?" And we all ran around in circles, and of course they loved it. And yeah. they were like, "Ah, let's play the running around in circles music and wake me up." And I'm like, "Oh, you know, like, <laughs> yeah." Um, Seven o'clock on a Sunday morning. <laughs> but yeah, right. So the point was that the treble didn't hurt their ears and the screams didn't freak them out. And I said, no, these are really nice people, really. I know they look scary. So they really grew up with, with extreme metal, as well as everything else that we listen to. Mm. And they're both totally at home with that. They don't listen to it all day, every day. But the point is, they're not intimidated by it. No. So the, the net result of that is that there's no sort of giant gap between what I like and what the kids like, because I like all their stuff as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, they're pretty much adults now anyway. So um, they have loads and loads of good stuff to listen to, for me to hear that I otherwise would not pick up. Mm. Um, anyway. I'm diverse. I digress. Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, nice. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's interesting because we're, you know, obviously very similar ages and stuff. And, you know, we kind of like, you know, we meet up every now and again and stuff. And it's interesting. I mean, my kids are a bit younger mm. than yours, but, you know, it's, there's such a gap between what I listen to and what they listen to. It's just. Yeah, but that might, that positive. gap may, may, uh, what's the word, narrow as you get older. And, yeah. you know, they appreciate a wider range. They look, listen back to the old man's old stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, well, because yeah, when I was doing the trapped in poetry stuff, you know, we the guys would come around, we do guitars and stuff at my 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 house and stuff, and mm. yeah, you know, it's just yeah, don't make it weird. Just it's just it is what it is, you know. Yeah, you know, that's you know. cool. I like that. I heard that one song. I think he did. I thought it was really good. I must send you the album. Yeah, yeah no, it's been good fun. It's been good fun to sort of get back into it and do it. But um, so uh, just looking down the list, then. So um, Rob Zombie, then another unauthorized book I did for oh, a paycheck. But I tell you, what, I was in. Interested, it was because not because of the music but because i like his films and mm. um i i wouldn't have done it if if uh, you know frankly the music's not really for me um mm. i appreciate all that alice cooper derived stuff as much as the next person you know with the creepy mask and horror um but i did really like his films i thought his um his directing in the in the Han- uh, halloween remake was yeah. really good same yeah. with ice cube actually that book i did way before that i was more interested in ice cube as an actor than i was as a rapper although i did like some of his albums um mm. so that those those were the angles um, of those books. And then sometimes you have your own agenda when you write these books. So for example, I did a book on Queens of the Stone Age, who I do like, mm. but they were in a band called Caius before they were in Queens of the Stone Age. Are you familiar with that band? Yeah, I know the name. Yeah, yeah. Great stuff, like really, really deep, groovy, Sabbathy sort of stuff um, that is completely different to what they did in Queens of the Stone Age. And that was really what I wanted to write about. So mm. sometimes you have an angle in these books that is slightly different from what you'd expect. Um, yeah. So I mean, I mean the other thing is, if if you're reviewing an album and you don't like it, yeah. fine. You've only got to spend like an hour listening yeah. to it, come up with goals or whatever. Listen to it a couple of times. Yeah, try, try and be constructive. If you've got to like work with a band for months that you don't like, yeah. So I've only, I think, what have I done? I've done ten books now, or twelve books, or something that are either a person's autobiography or, or the official biography of a band. Mm. Um, and in both cases, you have to spend tons of time interviewing these people. So yeah, that would be really tiresome if you didn't like them or their music or either. Actually, I'll only do it if I like the person and the music. So um, I guess you're at a stage now where you can pick and choose a bit more, yeah? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, and have been for some years. Mm. Um, uh, and also, I, I, you know, I'm an editor of a magazine. That's that's pretty much a full time job. So there's only a certain amount of stuff I can do. I try not to do more than one book a year. Sometimes two happen because of uh, sort of converging publication dates, but these things are a lot of work so uh, um, i'm just saying what i just said a minute ago which is yeah you, you really need to to find these people at least interesting and hopefully likable if you're going to spend time with them yeah. and that that works both ways as well they have to spend time with you and trust you as well 
um, because they're going to give up, you know, the secrets of their lives to you. You know, they they want to they want to feel that they can trust you and that the connection there. So yeah, okay. So, yeah. So I I mean, um, blah, 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 what was going to say? So yeah, what so we are we working on at the moment? Any any anything you can tell us or anything thrash related? I know you say you can't tell us the name of this nineties pop group, but. <sighs> They're resolutely not thrash based. Let me tell you that. <laughs> uh, let me think. What's going on? Um, well, this uh, Frank's book's coming out in October. I just right. did a book with an Italian. Uh, sorry, what am I saying? I just did a book with an Icelandic Viking metal band called Scalmold. Uh, and I saw the, that because um, yeah, I remember you went to Iceland a few times. And that was yeah, on, yeah, I did. Yeah, and oh, what's yeah. crazy about that book is the, the Icelandic president did the foreword <laughs> because in that country you literally can email the president and say, "Would you like to do the foreword for my book about heavy metal?" Well, yeah, right. Like, <laughs> look at a population like the size of Bristol, and it's like four hundred thousand or something, isn't it? That's exactly what it is. It might be three hundred thousand, of which two hundred thousand are in Reykjavik. But right. what most people fail to appreciate about Iceland is that it's really big. It's like mm. if you chopped England in half below Birmingham. Um, all that's about the size of Iceland, so it's quite it's quite a hefty chunk of land. Yeah. There's only three hundred thousand people in all of that. Um, but the president rolls up at shows with his family, no security, just okay. turns up. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't is, think is, of many it, countries where that would happen. You know? No, no, that's true. No, I mean I've been to Iceland a few times and I love it. It's yeah, yeah, absolutely brilliant. But yeah, I bet, I bet he's got a massive pickup truck, hasn't he? He may have. Yeah. I, I imagine. <laughs> I, he, I, imagine he's, I imagine he's. I uh, imagine he's. He gets around fairly easily, ceremonially. Um, but uh, okay, so metal wise, uh, yeah, there's, there's, oh man, I, I feel like such a tool not being able to tell you who it is. No, but, that's um, fine. I the, stuff, that. the stuff's all NDA'd until it comes out. So Frank's book's coming out. Then there's two volumes of autobiography by a well known heavy metal person. And then um, there's a couple of other books that are not related to music. And then uh, hopefully at some point, um, <laughs> it sounds so pretentious, but a very well known heavy metal person indeed. We'll finally get the book done that he and I have been promising to work on together for years and years and years, and uh, it may or may not work. Yeah, but uh, yeah. we'll see. So last time I saw you in person, then I think it was you were on the Creator Tour bus on the Arch Enemy Creator Tour. Do you know, I've got I've got a, a filing cabinet here with all my um, sort of VIP stickers on, and I think it was 2013. Was it in Bristol? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. You were pretty wiped out when I saw you. Because I've been on the tour bus, haven't I? Yeah. So what? Uh, I, mean, I looked for you. Is there's nothing about um, create a tour diary on the? Actually, you're happened? absolutely right. So that was going to happen. So I uh, it just hasn't done mm. uh, for for nothing other than logistical reason. Um, the relationship good and everything. So I spent a few days on their tour bus. That was right, interviewing them all. And mm. I had I had interviewed Miller anyway a few times for various record company related projects. Like one of their records was released um, or reissued, and I did some liner notes, and he did the. Yeah, I think he did the forwards, my second, one of my books. Yeah, he did. Mm. Um, always got on well with those guys. They're, they're really nice blokes. Um, yeah. But yeah, the book just didn't happen, but for no strong reason other than the, the stars weren't right, weren't aligned. Um, but uh, they're headlining Bloodstock, aren't they, this year? I'm supposed to be taking my son, so I'm looking forward to that for hands. Um, yeah, I guess so, in a couple of, week, couple of weeks' time, isn't it? Uh, yeah, mid-August, so whatever that is, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, was, uh, yeah. I, I guess bands like Creator and stuff, they've been around for so long, haven't they? And you know, I remember playing the old VHS uh, video Doomsday News, wherever it was, and with their <laughs> did that song "Terrible Certainty," but they, they spelled it wrong on the uh, the credit. It's ter- terribly certainty. <laughs> <laughs> I used to love all that um, noise noise record stuff. Oh, me too. Noise was amazing. In fact, there, there's an official book. Of, I have uh, got it on the shelf. Yeah, it's it's really, yours, it's, it's, what's good about it is that the um, the label owner and the artist. It's it's not been take it's not been edited out how much they hated each other oh, so really? all that stuff is still in um, and quite often the people will edit this stuff out yeah what was it um what was I going to say about creator oh the, you had a flexi disc I think that came out with sounds that had after the attack on it which I still think is an amazing song <laughs> and it, it was only ever demoed which is why it sounds really crap but it's still kind of a cool 80s metal tune um, yeah. But yeah, they, they do just keep going. They are a bit like ACDC in there. They just keep going. They say the same thing every single show. Mm. Um, the lineup is broadly broadly similar. They change bass players every now and then, don't they? But, um, <laughs> yeah. Who cares about the bass player? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, in fact, with that kind of music, you probably could just um, replicate a low note, couldn't you, from the guitar? You actually probably could. Well, this is what um, I, I imagine power metal is not your thing, is it really? But I mean, well, I, 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 like if you were going to a power metal gig, I'd come along. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Go and see. What's the? Fun? I can see you playing a band. Was it called Power Wolf? 
Uh, no, I got, um, Power Quest, wasn't it? it was Power Quest? <laughs> Power Quest. Was something else. Yes. Power Quest, right. Power something. Yeah, yeah. That was, I saw you. So that, that stuff's fine. It's all a bit cheerful, isn't it? And quite jaunty and happy. <laughs> It's yours, yeah. I find it I find it a little bit of hard work, but um <laughs> I still like some of those early Halloween songs. Um yeah. and you know, you could even argue that a couple of priest songs have have, have that sort of feel. Mm. Um yeah. No, not really my cup of tea. Anyway, I interrupted you, sorry. You you were gonna no, talk just, about just say, just, no ba- I mean bands now are some of them are going out without bass players, aren't they? The bass the, the bass the bass part is all on the backing track. Right. So uh, I did not know that, but I'm Yeah, not I mean oh, well Power Wolf, I mean, yeah, they're big big band they play loads of you know big shows and stuff i saw them in yeah. bristol yeah two guitar drums keyboard singer no bass player Ooh. everything else is played it's just the bass that's on the backing yeah, track just the bass player on the backing <laughs> track it's like just stood, stood there in front with my thumb down you know <laughs> <laughs> and a resolute it's not right like, frown it? on your face well, well I, it, I, it, I, I guess I, you know, yeah we, but you see i know a few touring musicians right and and i know how much it costs Mm. And if you can replicate pretty much everything, apart from the vocals and the guitars, you'd be tempted, wouldn't you? You know, if, yeah. if it was. So no, I, much as I, I don't like to see live musicians replaced with a laptop, I understand why why economic pressures make that inevitable. Yeah, I was, exactly. What I was going to say. Yeah, I mean, you know, if it costs, it costs another mouth to feed on the tour. You know, everything else. You know, if you... But you might as well just send a thumb drive to the to the venue, just play yeah. it. You know, just everyone listen to the CD on karaoke. I mean, you know. It's... Yeah. Uh, it's starting to creep in. I remember a few years ago, Fear Factory used a drum program instead of a drummer. Uh, it was like not the recent album or the one before that was on for that. And I was quite surprised because that's... Uh, well, I wasn't surprised rather because it's quite a machine-like sort of tone. But uh, they had had all these famous drummers before. So I, like Gene Hogler and the rest of them. So I thought um, they might they might at least do that. But no. <laughs> uh, it's, it, but, but the thing I met was it's a visual thing, isn't it? And the drums are a massive part. I think so, yeah. Oh, and the other thing is that now what's happening as well is that a lot of the producers are playing on the albums as well. Yeah. So I think they'll show up. Yeah. Uh, actually, I wasn't, but he's a good oh. example. But mm. he's a great musician, and, and he has a he has a great he has a long term track record, which is amazing. No, I was thinking more of sort of new kids who are coming up out of the music colleges. Um, they're able to either play bass, for example, or program a bass part, and engineer the track, and record it, and mm. mix and master it. Right. So yeah. when I was in Iceland uh, with Skalmold. Um, they had this amazing, or they went to this amazing studio in downtown, or not downtown, on the end of Reykjavik, um, where this producer, this really cool guy, could do all that stuff in one stop and, and get them the, the mastered, ready to go album mm. with everything done. Um, and if they needed a guitar or keyboard track, he'd do it. Um, and there are a few in America as well, like the, a band will go into a studio with no bass player or no drummer because they know the engineer or the producer will do it. So it's all sort of shrinking in, you know. It's not, it's not like Iron Maiden going to Nassau in the Bahamas to do, which <laughs> record did they do? Oh, yeah, was it? No, no, no. no. It, was, it was when, yeah, probably, yeah. It was all peace yeah. of mind or whatever. When they had some money, they went there, you know, and got it all done. And, um, you know, the, the, a video would cost literally $500,000, you know. All, all that stuff is gone. Um, mm. But, so, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, bands just, just pump, 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 pump out sort of lyric videos now, don't they? Yeah. Video is so important. Social media is so important. Um, every song has to have a video attached to it. But that last Metallica album, all the albums had a, all the songs had a, um, a, like a fully, fully professional video attached, didn't they, for YouTube? Yeah. Even though you would think that would damage um, physical sales, it didn't. No. Um, so yeah, it's a strange world, my friends. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, you know? it's, a, it's a, it's a big old, um, big old change from when we were at school and trying to record stuff on four tracks and stuff, and it sounded a Tascam. What was it? Fostex. Four track. Oh God, I can't remember who it was now. You recorded a demo of mine. That was it. I was in a band called Just Like Her, a sort of indie band. Didn't I screw it With... up? To get... <laughs> no, you did a good job. Me. No, you did a good job. And actually, I was going to say something um, uh, a little bit sad about poor old James Candy, who was our drummer, um, and who died in a car crash. He did. Um, I, yes, I remember that. Like Ten yeah. years later, yeah, he was a good guy. Uh, I was mm. gutted to hear that. But I remember this band I had. It was a couple of dudes from um, Royal Grammar School in Bristol. Oh, okay. Me on bass and then James on drums and uh, you you recorded the demo, which mm. I still have somewhere. I've uh, someone digitised it and I've got some files. Um, I think <laughs> you just press play basically didn't you? or record rather. Right? Play and record. record. <laughs> 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 Held them down all the way through the song. <laughs> so after I'd sellotaped over the tape thing to allow you. To... <laughs> cool. <laughs> Who doesn't do that? Wait, they don't do that now. <laughs> Yeah, basically the idea is yeah you, you don't record more than three things because the hiss builds up too much 
there is quite a lot of hiss on that tape, I will say. But, but you know, uh, I, I, it's I, ambience. I, yeah, but I said this before. I mean, digital recording these days is fantastic, but also it means you can procrastinate forever and never actually finish anything because you can no. always tweak it. Oh, we've got no. a new amp sim. That'll chuck that on. Uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, had a play through a Kemper not long ago. Someone demoed it for me, and I thought, you know what? I, <laughs> I would never decide on a on a, <laughs> uh, a, a, a what do they call it a patch or something a, or the, yeah, the right patch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, all, all the Slayer guys use Kempers and stuff, don't they? In Testament and bands like that. I don't know if Slayer do particularly, but uh, I know an awful lot of bands do. I know Creator do. They they have a deal with uh, an amp, man, amp manufacturer in Sweden, I think, or you know Germany, and uh, the amps stay at home in the studio. <laughs> well, yeah, because you capture it exactly, and and suddenly you can you know about the size of a lunchbox, so you can just plug into the the desk. Hmm. Where you go. Yeah, there's a there's a portable Kemper now, isn't there? It just recently came out. I think that the actual unit before was about the size of a proper amp head. Um, it's quite expensive. Yeah, oh, on, yeah, I've got a Tech Twenty One um, Sans amp here. You know, you know those. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they're good. They have a good bit of gear. That sounds um, nice going through the cars, bro. Yeah, that's how I'll transform cars from uh, <laughs> that terrible garage sound from the 80s to something actually usable. Yeah, I haven't plugged it in. It's just sitting here, uh, li- you know, looking, taking up space. But there you go. That, that was a pointless buy, but yeah. Oh, Mike, you got to get out of the house, though, mate, to be fair. <laughs> it only cost you 30 quid. 30 quid, get in. What ever, what ever happened to the original one? Did you sell it? I sold it to you, mate. Did you? Yeah. And um, I, don't know what, I don't know what you did with it. No, um, presumably you got rid of it sharpish. <laughs> We're certainly not in here. <laughs> no, who knows where it went? I mean, um, you had a, a professional touring band, right? So presumably it went out the window pretty quickly when you got some proper gear. I remember. Yeah, I can't remember. I mean, I, I had so many shit. I, I, like I said in that in that interview, it was all true. In that, I've never bought expensive gear. It's, no. It's, does it work? What's the point? What's the point in buying thousands of pounds? Do it all in the studio. You know, that's where, that's where the money needs to go. No, precisely. Yeah. I've got a whole bunch of guitars and basses here and there's loads more in the other rooms as well. Mm. Um, but uh, none of them sound great until you run, get a little preamp attached and then it's fine. But uh, I would worry about super expensive gear anyway. You know, and I certainly wouldn't want to take it out on the road or get some uh, luggage hand, baggage hand to, to hold on to it. So. <laughs> yeah. So there that, you go. When, when that guitar case is like all floppy, like, oh Christ, I <laughs> snapped off it. What's that in the background? Is that a Schecter over there? That is no, that is a Solar. Solar, I'm not familiar. So it's um, oh, it's the, the guy, the guy from the Haunted. I can't remember his name. Oh yeah, yeah, guy. yeah. Yeah, uh, Patrick Jensen. No, no, no. no. Um, um, so, Ola uh, England. Viola. Oh, Ola England. Yeah, the new guy. Yeah, right, so yeah. he's cleverly put his OLAs, put his name in the middle of it, and created Solar. But no, he's amazing. That's a baritone. Oh, nice. It's like a bass and a guitar. Mm, like <laughs> a bass and a guitar. So, yeah, obviously, yeah. you know, four strings is normally me, so you know, I can just about manage six. <laughs> Any yeah. more is a waste, isn't it? You know? Chug, chug, yeah, yeah. Um, no, very cool. No, he's great, actually. In fact, I like a lot of those Swedish guys. Uh, I got to know well, Patrick Jensen is the one I, I know best from that band. Um, they were great. There, there was a whole, in fact, well, we should really talk about thrash metal at some point, but it'd be well, it's all metal, isn't it? It's all so, well, yeah, but the, re, the resurgence of thrash was interesting, wasn't it? I remember in about 2000 or 2002 or something you had all these bands in Sweden there was one there was a Haunted obviously and then there was um, I think they called some like Corporation 187 or some completely forgettable name but mm. they were very thrashy oh and Carnal Forge did you ever call oh, Carnal Forge yeah, I know the name yeah yeah. yeah. If, if you like that kind of really really squeaky clean thrash metal they were there they were good mm. um, and, and then um, Gamma Bomb Irish band yeah Gamma Bomb yeah yeah yeah, yeah. There's, there's loads of stuff. I mean, especially you know, again, you know, with, with the you know, Facebook and stuff. There's loads of thrash bands in the UK now. You know, the popular and, popular style of music. I mean, it is very very fun to listen to and full of adrenaline still. Yeah, it, um, yeah, it is. It is, and it seems to be anyone can do it really. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, is that it's very hard to do, isn't it? You know, playing those. Like I said earlier, I haven't got the picking hand for that music. I really haven't. I've never developed it, and uh, but people seem to. And those Evile guys, it's mental what they, what they can do. Yeah. So no, fair play to them. Fair yeah, play. I like I like their stuff. I like um, Silosis as well. They're quite, quite yeah. And they, 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 they play in standard tuning, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for that uh, vintage sound. <laughs> the band I know best, British metal band I know best, is uh, Akakok. I don't know if you've come across mm. them. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Gentleman uh, got... Satanist. They still. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, I, I had dinner with Jason the other week. I, I know them well. <laughs> uh, I was dinner with Satan the other week. Yeah. <laughs> We well we burned a few we sacrificed a few goats. Well, um, no, no, that's that's a great band. They they mix up all this stuff like the Cure and Gary Newman and all and the Sister Mercy and all this really really weird dark mm-hmm. stuff with with um, 
sort of uh, death style riffs, as in the band death, mm. you know, and mm. uh, they, they make it, they do it really well. So no, I'm a big fan of them. And I think it's probably fairly healthy, the, the scene. I don't know if anybody's making any money out of it, but, you know, we'll see when, when things resume. It's the old mantra, there's no money in metal, is there really? That's basically, you know. Well, there always was, though, wasn't there? Yeah, but, you know, that was 30 years ago, probably. I mean, you're, well, probably I think... doing, you're doing all right, haven't it? But, you know. <laughs> well, I, I write about everything else, mate. I mean, I, yeah. in, a, in a given issue of, of um, bass player, a, a tenth of it will be metal and the rest will be, every, will be everything else. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and the books aren't always about that stuff either. But it's it's music generally that people are treating as a hobby now rather than a job, aren't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, things might change. Yeah. So what about the sisters? You mentioned the Sisters of Mercy there. I mean, I mean, I remember you were you were quite big on them back in the day. This corrosion. Well, into them. Still love them. Yeah. I, yeah. I had a bit of a coup actually. Um, I think it was in about 2009. I'd got to know the one of the guitar players quite well, mm. and. Um, uh, I was writing a lot for classic rock at the time, and I said to them, "Why don't we do? If I can get an interview with Andrew Eldridge, the singer, would you run it?" And they went, "Hell yeah, we would." Um, and it turned out he hadn't done any press for twelve years, um, and I managed to wangle it. So I flew to, flew to Budapest to do this interview. Wow! And uh, yeah, it was really funny. I got there; they were all going on the piss, and mm. um, we, we were in a venue in um, Budapest, and it, they brought out this massive tray of um, flaming shots. Oh, yeah, shots yeah. on fire and you were supposed yeah. to drink them through a straw and um, they said <laughs> whatever you do don't drop this don't drop one of these alright because the whole place will go up <laughs> and what did I do I went oh fuck <laughs> and dropped it I genuinely dropped it there's this <laughs> 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 everyone went ah like diving to the corners and it all got sorted out and everyone was laughing but in the end I, I ended up writing about that in, in the piece uh, you know flaming cocktails with the sister mercy and uh, had a really good time with Eldridge actually he's a bit of a sort of severe older older statesman, but he was happy to talk. So I could indulge my teenage fanhood of, of the Sister Mercy, which was um, which yeah. was great and a real coup because you hadn't done any press for some. Yeah, I mean they haven't released any. New, I could be wrong, but I mean they haven't. No, you're right. They haven't. Yeah, they just tore off the back of the old stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They write new songs and play them, and people oh, record okay. it and put it on YouTube. But no, they they don't they don't need to. Um, no. You know, it's fine. But now talking about a band that cuts its cost live, the. It's two guitars and vocals, and the yeah. bass, drums, and keyboards are all handled from a laptop. Yeah. But Doctor then there was work. Dr. Avalanche and co, yeah? Dr. Avalanche, right, yeah. They haven't had a bass player for years, and the drum machine, it was always a drum machine. Yeah. Um, so no, then the, 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 they, they, they like to have the dry ice coming uh, towards you from the stage. Yes. And then the lights coming from behind the dry ice, so you can't really see the front of the musicians. That's just their art direction. I guess um, if the wind blew strongly the wrong direction, you, you, all the magic would go. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gets getting <laughs> and blows at the stage. <laughs> yeah. What we're actually looking at are just, just one guy and two guys playing guitar. <laughs> <laughs> keyboard. Keep, guy with a keyboard. <laughs> no, so that was fun. So it's been nice. I have to say it's been nice. Most of my interviews as a journalist have been not on the subject of metal at all. They've been everything else you can think of. So yeah. I, I did all the Duran Durand and all that stuff as well and, and all the kind of cheesy pop music that I liked before I got into metal. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, a lot of the sort of, you know, uh, things like um, Frankie as Hollywood and stuff, they're great songs. They're great musicians. They're great songwriters, aren't they? Completely. And, and the production the state still of the art, up. you know. And you know when you when you get those amazing eighties producers who used all that stuff for the first time, it, it either sounds terrible or it sounds good. Yeah, um, it's pretty guitar music that didn't sound that good in the eighties actually. Uh, you know, synth computer stuff sounded excellent. Mm. Um, but even all the guitar parts on those Duran songs that were very sort of tinny and in the background and mixed low. Um, so yeah, all yeah. good. Interesting. Alice, Alice, good. All right, mate. Cool. That's that's that, that's been really really good fun. So I'm going to edit all that together and. Um, Lovely. Make you sound like a dick. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I can do that quite easily by myself, mate. No need to, uh, hey, no need to do anything for that part. Oh, mate, lovely. Well, let me know whenever you're back from the fatherland and we'll have a pint. That's it then. You just witnessed Joel and John chatting down the pub. Or an interview, as we like to call it. Okay, next up, from Ontario, Canada, this is a young band called Hacksaw, and this is their first single, M-T-S. Yeah, it's 
river That is what you play Your book is way But change the end It's time to say Bye bye my friend You sit down Time for the pain That cost If you question I'm on You will get more the end of this week's episode thank you as always to our guest Joel thank you to John for running that interview um, thank you to all the mute guys who let us use their music as always we're going to play about some black and thrash from London this is Grey Volta taken from their new EP by the same title this is Hell's Necromancer see you next time <laughs>